It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Mike Michalowicz. By his 35th birthday, he had founded and sold two multi-million dollar companies. Confident that he had found the formula to success, he became an angel investor and proceeded to lose his entire fortune. Then he started all over again, driven to find better ways to grow healthy, strong companies. Among other innovative strategies, Mike created the Profit First formula, a way for businesses to ensure profitability from their very next deposit forward. Mike is now running his third million dollar venture, is a former small business columnist for the Wall Street Journal, is the former MSNBC business makeover expert, is a popular keynote speaker on innovative entrepreneurial topics, and is the author of Profit First, Surge, The Pumpkin Plan, and The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, which Business Week deemed the entrepreneur's cult classic. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Unfortunately, you're talking to dentists who studied eight years of math and chemistry and physics. Sure. They graduate eight years later and they didn't get one hour of business. Unbelievable, but true. I get it. So, get so it. help them out, buddy. What, how do they go from being a doctor of oral health and no physics and chemistry and root canals, fillings and crowns? Yeah. To actually making a profit so that one day they can pay back their $350,000 of student loans. So what you need to know is that logic does not work to our advantage here. It's to our disadvantage. There is a formula that dentists, actually all entrepreneurs have been told that is totally wrong. And what we're told is that you have to have your sales, your patients coming, you have to incur expenses, get that equipment, the x-ray machine, all that stuff. And then the money left over is your profit. And that's a lie. That's not true. And I mean, logically, it makes sense, Howard, but from a behavioral standpoint, it's not true. There was a study conducted in part by the SBA, some other organizations. They identified that 83% of small businesses are surviving check by check. 83% of dentists don't have enough money to pay the rent next month unless more patients come in today. So there's this constant check to check survival. And that formula, we're told, where profit comes last teaches us that's the last consideration. Oh, maybe at the end of the month we'll be profitable, maybe at the end of the year, and we keep kicking the can down the road with profitability. Profit can't come last, it must come first. That is truly, truly wise words. Man, you have so many books, I, I don't know where to start. What do you want to talk about first? You want to talk about- Well, definitely about profit, first, profit first, because we're profit, on the subject of profitability. Profit first professionals or, or the book Profit First, the, Transform the book, Your Business from a Cash-Eating Monster to a Money-Making Machine. That's the one. Let's talk about the book, because I, I think this can serve every dentist watching right now. And, and here's what it is. The old formula, I just explained, sales minus ex equals profit is a lie. Most businesses aren't profitable. The only simple, most powerful suggestion I make that you should write down right now and do is that profit must come first. And what I mean by that is no longer is it sales minus expenses equals profit. It's sales minus profit equals expenses. And what I'm explaining here basically just flipping the variables. So mathematically, this is the same as we've been told before, but behaviorally, it's different. As sales come into our business, we immediately take a predetermined percentage and allocate it to a profit. You, you bring in $1,000 of sales today, 10% of that, for example, we take $100, we transfer it to another bank, we hide it away, and then you have to run your dentist, uh, your, your location off of the $900. And I'm telling you, if you can run a dentistry off of $1,000, you can run it off of $900. But by taking that top 10% and allocating to profit first, you're assuring profitability. And I just went to Amazon.com. I pulled up your book, which has an unbelievable 195 star reviews. And I just retweeted that out uh, at, at Howard Ferran to our 20,000 Twitter followers, because uh, right now they're probably all commuting to work right now, so they can't take notes. So if they, yeah. get, if they get that book, they're gonna learn, what did you say they're gonna learn to go from sales minus expenses equal profit to sales minus profit equals expenses? Yeah, you're, you're gonna, that's the basic premise. You're gonna learn that if you take your profit first, this is nothing new, by the way. I didn't invent something here. This is the pay yourself first system we've been told to do in our personal lives. I'm just the guy who's saying it applies to more than just our personal living. It applies to our professional living, our expenses. So 
when money comes in, we allocate to our profit. But there's more to it. We're going to use what's called the envelope system. This is something I'm sure, Howard, someone in your family tree used. My mother did this. When money came in, she divided money up into different envelopes, one for food, one for the community, one for the mortgage. And then when she went food shopping, she'd always take the food envelope and only use the money that's in there. Well, businesses need to pre-allocate money to its intended purpose. The problem that most dentistries have is $1,000 come in and the dentist looks at it and says, I have $1,000 to spend. That's not true. When $1,000 comes in, we must pre-allocate that 10% to profit. But also, what about paying yourself as the owner the salary you're going to live off? Let's allocate money to that so we have a consistent salary. What about your tax liabilities? Let's allocate money to tax liabilities. What about buying that equipment that you think you need, that new x-ray machine or whatever? We must allocate money to that. What about paying your staff? So we put money into these different envelopes. And now with the money pre-allocated, before we spend the money, we see truly what we have available to run our business and we don't go in excess in any category. You know, it's funny. I, we, my mom did that when us for a little. We had like four or five different piggy banks and we had goals on yes. each one and we were putting nickels and pennies and quarters and all that stuff. Um, these guys, um, you, you also have the Profit First Professionals, ProfitFirstProfessionals.com. Right. Um, you, you talk about um, accountants, bookkeeping experts. The, these guys don't even know the vocabulary. That's right. That's right. So traditional accountants and bookkeepers, if, if, if you go to a traditional accountant and say, I need to take my profit first, th that may actually be like putting a uh, – a uh, fork in their brain. It's like, whoa, that, that, that's what are you talking about? That's not how businesses run. Accountants and bookkeepers, ironically, for the centuries since the invention of gap accounting have been told, telling us, don't look at your bank accounts ever. Just read your income statement, your balance sheet, your cash flow statement, run the metrics, run the KPIs, blah, blah, blah. And what do we do as dentists and business owners? We revert to looking at our bank balance. So I started an organization called Profit First Professionals. Uh, we have members who specialize in different categories. Connie Jaycox is the definitive profit expert for dentists. And so now, if, if a dentist is looking to drive profitably in their business, they have an accountant and a bookkeeper and even a coach who can work with them in driving profitability and understands that traditional accounting doesn't work not that it's wrong, it's logical, it's just not matched to our behavior. So Profit First Professionals are people who do that work, but also understand the behavioral component and use the Profit First system to drive profitability. It's funny, the CPAs, every dentist I know, uh, I've been practicing 30 years, every dentist I know who's been practicing 30 years, their CPAs only given them a statement of income, a P&L. They've never even given them a statement of cash flow. 99% uh, of dentists wouldn't even know what a statement of cash flow was, and they only right. understand what a balance sheet is if they're trying to uh, get a loan or a divorce. I mean, you know, so, so um, uh, you, I, you talk about key performance indicators, and that's even more sad because yeah. every time a dentist gets done doing a filling, if you stop them right as he was leaving, say, okay, you said a filling, what did it cost? They barely right. know because they signed up to 10 different insurance plans, so they get 10 different prices. And you say, right. well, did you make a dollar or lose a dollar? They have no idea. They, yeah. they just, it's, they it's, just hope if they're busy enough and work really hard at the very end, there'll be some money left over. Yeah, yeah, that's the hope. And so, and accountants and bookkeepers have been yelling at dentists and business owners of all types saying, please just look at these numbers, learn how to read them. But we don't. And that was the great lesson for me. As I grew my businesses, my accountant was yelling at me to understand these documents, begging me to study this. And I didn't. But what I did do is I reverted to what I call bank balance accounting. I, I have my... Uh, my phone with me right now, I log into my phone, I see how much money is listed in my bank accounts, and I make decisions based upon my bank balance. So I came to understand that if accountants and bookkeepers can't convince us to do this, we'll never do it. Can we create a system that works with what we already naturally do, log into our bank accounts? So these different envelopes I told you, these are actually checking accounts. And the beauty of the system is now you continue to do what you've always done, log into your phone or on the computer, see what your bank balance is. But now that there's different accounts with different envelopes, you know what intended purpose the money will serve. And, and people, Howard, have said to me, well, I can just do this on a spreadsheet, right, or my accounting system. And the answer to that is actually you cannot because we revert to looking at our bank. And if we do this on a spreadsheet and we log into our bank account, we may not look at the spreadsheet and see what money uh, the the money has been allocated to or what purpose the money has been allocated to. So we have to do this at our bank so it's in our natural path in 
every single time we look at our bank balance, we see how the money's been divided up before we spend it. I've always thought it's weird is, you know, math should be purely emotional. I mean, one plus one equals two. It should make you excited or sad or you don't feel sorry for three. I sure. mean, it just, it's just math. But when it comes to those numbers representing money, it seems to be so emotional with human. Why, why do you think money is an emotional behavioral issue as opposed to just math? Yeah, so because we ha- we get, see it as a possession, and humans are prone to what's called loss aversion. Loss aversion is when I possess something, I will go to extreme measures to retain it, more so than if I never owned that thing in the first place. For example, say I, I buy a car, we'll just say it's a, a Toyota or something. I own this Toyota, I don't make a payment, the lendy comes to me and says, we're going to repossess your car if you don't make a payment within the next week. What am I going to do? I'll take on a second job. I'll run my dentistry, but you know, at night I'll be running Uber and Lyft just to make some extra money to retain what I already possess. Now, here's the irony. I could have been doing that Uber and Lyft work in addition to the dentist work I'm doing for, forever, and I could have bought the Mercedes, but I didn't. See, we are more driven to keep what we possess than we are to gain something new. So when it comes to money, when it flows in our business, we will go to extraordinary, often illogical measures to keep the money. We'll actually spend lots of money on equipment or stuff to reduce our taxes. We'll literally spend hundreds of dollars to save tens of dollars. So our behavior around money is very much driven about uh, like, like it's a possession. It seems like there's, uh, you know, it's really easy to look out across the two, uh, in the United States, there's 211,000 citizens who have a license to practice dentistry, and, mm. and there's 2 million around the world. When you look out o- over them, it's easy to tell, okay, these are boys, these are girls, these are Irish, these are you know, Vietnamese, but it's harder to tell the, um, that these are the uh, silent generation born 33 to 45, these are the baby boomers 46 to 64, this is Generation X, 65 to 79. These are the millennials, 1980 to 1995. Uh, Generation Z, 96 to present. When you look at those millennials versus Generation X versus baby boomers versus silent generation or go pre-1933, the greatest generation, do they deal with money differently, do you think? Do you, do you think millennials are different today than, say, me? I was born in 62, so... I'm at yeah. the end of the baby boomers. Do you, do you think baby boomers versus Generation X versus millennial dentist see money differently? I th- I think they see money the same in in many aspects. Because I've worked with uh, businesses of all different sizes, owned by all different age groups, but their experiences play sig- uh, a significant influence into how they behave around money. So they see money the same. It's a vehicle or a tool to either express yourself, to to uh, procure things, to purchase things, uh, to, to experience things. So people consistently see it as a tool, but their believability or their perception of how, uh, the, how much they can retain the money varies. People from the greatest generation that, that I've done business with um, have gone through basically depressions, uh, multiple. They see the the fickleness of money, that it can go away overnight. And therefore, in general, from that experience, I see them cling and retain much longer. Um, the, the newer generations that have been in boom periods think money just flows on trees. You snap your fingers and it appears, and they're much more fickle with money. So it's funny, the people, their behavior around it doesn't change in regards to, it's a tool, it's a vehicle, but their belief in its availability changes based upon their personal experiences. I think every generation will go through and should go through depressions or major recessions and wake you up. I mean, 2008, that was a big wake up call for people in their, in their earning years, your twenties, thirties, forties, and fifties. But the people who were 18 then, and now are 25, 26, didn't experience the pain of that. They don't have the experience. It may think that money still grows on trees. They'll change too, once they go through their challenge. Yeah, and, and I also want to tell you that in my 54 years, none of these talking heads experts uh, predicted uh, the Berlin Wall falling down, <laughs> no, no. the Arab uprising, 9-11, you know, all these things. So it does, so when everybody tells you everything's great and rosy, you never know what you're going to wake up to the next day. 
Oh my God. It's, it's so true. I mean, everything seemed to be booming before the 2008 collapse. Uh, everything seemed to be booming before the nine 11 tax. I'll never forget that. That two days before that, my business was the strongest it ever was two days after that the phone didn't ring at all. And so there, there's these unexpected challenges that we're faced with. But I will tell you this, if we build a cash reserve during the good days and the bad and continue to build the cash reserve, that is a powerful tool for carrying us through these tough challenges. So you have so many books. So talk about um, The Surge, another one of your books with uh, a gazillion uh, five star surge, time the marketplace, ride the wave of consumer na- demand, and become your industry's big kahuna. What takeaways yes. do you think these dentists could learn from that? So, what I found is there's movements in markets, and here's the big lesson find a niche and cater to it better than anyone else can. You know, is it the Irish community something you mentioned earlier? What, what does the Irish community need? Are there certain things? Uh, maybe there's a certain religious sect, and we need to practice our dentistry in a way that complies with their religious, religious kind of guidelines, and the person that adheres to it will get recognition in that community. The, the unquestionable thing about Surge, as I was writing that book, is I was observing surfers. Surfers look for one wave at a time and try to ride that wave once they select it all the way in. The, the equivalent in the business space is a niche community. Identify a small community and observe it. How is it moving? What's the changes going on? And what can you do to be in front of that change? And if you're a provider that understands what that niche needs, the niche will talk about you and they start to carry you forward. One of my favorite uh, guys on that was a dentist in Boston named uh, uh, Tom Warren. He started practicing there, and, and his whole office looked like himself. And then he realized that um, every time he went to the barber, everybody coming in and leaving when he was there had an accent. And he finally asked the barber, what, what is that accent? Uh-huh. And he said, it's Portuguese from Brazil. He said, there's a gazillion Portuguese that live around here. So he actually went back to school and learned oh, so Portuguese, started so networking with that barber, and, and got himself a thousand Portuguese people. And, and I, I've seen that so many. Um, one of the smartest uh, dentists I know in California got out. He realized most of the dentists, th- this is 30 years ago, most of the dentists looked like me and you. And there were pockets of, in this com- San Fran community, these people are all from Thailand. These people are all from Vietnam and Korea. And he, he saw 10 ethnic markets. And he set up 10 different um, dental offices where everyone so would be completely staffed by People from um, uh, Malaysia or, or um, you know, yeah. uh, um, w- w- Vietnam. And because I would think if I moved to Vietnam and couldn't speak a word of Vietnamese, I'd want to find a dental office where they all spoke English. Of course. And, and so he target marketed those guys. And he, I think two years out of school, he owned 10 offices doing a million dollars a year each just by target marketing. So I love behavioral uh, influence and, and understanding human behavior. Actually, I'm working on a book uh, that's not my next book, but the book after that's all about behavioral influence. And one thing that you're talking about too is called commonality. When we see common traits in someone else, we have instant trust for them. If you and I went to the same high school, oh my God, all of a sudden we're the best of friends because we have this common thing. Well, the, we do judge people. Sadly, we do judge people by their skin. If we someone, see someone that looks like us, we immediately have a stronger affection toward them. So look like your customers. Now we can't morph our face. Well, nowadays you can, but, <laughs> but we can dress like our customers. We can show respect for the community that we're serving by having uh, decor around our office that speaks to that community. So the things you can do to establish that commonality, which establishes trust and trust builds business. I am um, one mile away from the Guadalupe Indian Reservation that has like 5,000 legal uh, citizens, Spanish only, and probably about 10,000 undocumented. And I'm surprised that even on my own corner, almost every office you go into, no, not even one person speaks Spanish. And I've always told people to start demographic, just Google the demographics of your own zip code. And if 15% of your zip code speaks Farsi, why don't you have a Persian Farsi speaking dental assistant or receive somebody, you know, you really got to match your, your demographics. uh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we are the ones who have to change. See, that's the mistake. I think it's arrogant to say, oh, our customer needs to change. You know, there's 5,000 of them that need to change or one of me that needs to change. The, the, the <laughs> numbers speak for themselves. We got to change. Oh, yeah. And they're the best patients ever. They always pay everything in cash. Oh, <laughs> that ain't too bad. Yeah. I mean, they're just, it's just fantastic. Um, 
You also wrote The Pumpkin Plan, a simple strategy to grow a remarkable business in any field with a remarkable 377 five-star reviews. How do you, how do you get all these five-star reviews? What, what is The Pumpkin Plan, a simple strategy to grow a remarkable business in any field? Yeah, so uh, the five star reviews are. Uh, I have a very, I'm very appreciative of of the audience who reads it. I mean, I have, I'm really lucky. Uh, the one book, Profit First, with the 190 reviews, that only came out three months ago. I mean, that's really getting traction. And w- what it is, you'll start see a common parallel is it's always a study in behavior, and I always also do an analogy to something else that's happening in life. So the surge was actually an analogy to surfing. Um, in pumpkin plan, I actually studied pumpkin farmers of all things. I studied colossal pumpkin farmers and found that they changed the growing process of pumpkins just by a little bit. But as a result of that minor, minor change, the pumpkin responds with explosive organic growth. So my question was, how does a business grow explosively, organically, and healthily just with minor change? Here's the stuff that blew my mind away. I found out that if you get rid of your lowest 10% of customers, your business will immediately become more profitable. Why is that? In any business, the lowest 10% of customers are the customers who pay you the least, are never satisfied with the service, require rework, don't pay their bills. They're a pain to do business with. Here's the irony. You get rid of those clients. You don't have to do the rework. Uh, you, you, they weren't paying you anyway, so you're not doing work for free. Me profit booster. But the best part is the time that avails. The lowest 10% of customers takes about 20% of our time. They take an inordinate amount of time. So now it frees up time of my own and my staff where I can focus and target my best customers. The, the second thing I learned in Profit First is interview your top 10%. Once you know who your true best customers are, the ones that pay in cash, they're wonderful, interview them and say, where do you hang out? Where do I find more people like you because I love you? You can clone your best customers simply by interviewing them and asking them where they congregate. You know, the, the young kids, I would say their, their first major nightmare mistake is people come in, they get a couple thousand dollars for the dentistry, they don't pay when they leave, and then they beg them for money with statements every 30, 60, 90, 120 days. Right. And, right. uh, you know, the average dental office, according to the American Dental Association, is 65% overhead. So if I do $3 of work on you, you don't pay, I had to spend $2 for all my rent, mortgage, equipment, build-out, computer insurance. So, so you know, I can't, ima- I can't go anywhere. I, I don't know where I could go. I can't walk into the mall and grab a uh, pair of tennis shoes and say, hey, bill me. I mean, every place right. you go, and, and that bottom 10%, you're right. I mean, when you say you need a filling, and I say, okay, give me 200 bucks, 95% do. It's yeah. that 5% that say, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, they, they, never even, they never even thought they were going to pay you. And, and right. these, these young dentists, they, 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 um, they really, physicians and dentists, people who go to college eight years to heal you with their hands and surgery and work all day in operating, they just have such a hard time asking for money, especially up front. But if you go to McDonald's and order a Big Mac, the 16 year old kid says, give me two bucks. And if you say, I don't have two bucks, he's just like, okay, next. Um, so yeah. how do you, how do you help emotionally these young doctors listening to you that just have a, they, they can't say money. They can't say customer. Yep. They can't yep. say sales. I mean, I mean, really, I mean, yep. they, they yep. can't even say the word sales. If you say, well, what's your, what's your, um, treatment plan conversion rate? I mean, if you, if you presented right. 10 right. fillings, how many of them close? Right. Like, close. What do, what do you mean close? Yep. I mean, how do you get into their, it's almost like a religion. You know what I mean? How do you yeah, get, totally do. how do you get dentists to say dirty words like sales and yeah. pay me now? So I found there's three ways. First of all, if you're terrified to ask, you're, train your employee to ask. So you're once removed. You know, often the person yielding the service also trying to collect the money feels they're putting a value on themselves and it's very uncomfortable. So if you have to find someone else to do it. Second technique is don't call it a sale, call it a service. That's the big one. Say, you know, I am looking to service. I'm not selling to the person. I'm servicing the person. And realize the money they're paying you is what's called appreciation points. They're not actually not paying you money. This is how much they're going to value you. Literally, if, if I use your services and you charge me nothing, I have zero appreciation for you. If you charge me $10,000, I have 10,000 appreciation points of business. I want a successful outcome. The people that pay you more want a greater outcome and are more vested in a successful outcome. So call it a service call, call it appreciation points. 
And one final tip is for those clients that just can't afford you, realize it's charity work and call it your charitable hours. I mean, label it what it really is and say, once a month, I'm going to do one day of charitable work. So you put parameters around it and you tell a person say, if you can't pay me now, I do do one month, uh, one day a month where I give away my work for free. It has to be on such and such day and you have to be here and you may have to wait for the entire day, but the work will be done free. So now you're, you're giving services to people who can't afford it, but you're quarantining it and not mixing in with your regular clients. You know what you said that having skin in the game, it's so true in every single Medi- all Medicaid practice, or if it's free, Indian Public Health Service, these, these, these welfare clinics, their number one problem is no-shows and cancellation. Oh. I mean, here they have a chance to come in and get their tooth fixed for free, and they have for free. to triple book because two out of three won't even show up for free. But I bet if that person had to pay $10 out of their own wallet to make that appointment, what do you think the no-show rate would be? Oh, my God. It would cut in half or more. Yeah, and, the, I mean, and then and then the 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 um the big government people would say that that was mean. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, it should be access to free dentistry on you know in this area. And it's like when you make something free, it the value's gone. It devalues it exactly. So listen, if if the government saw that as a mean or inappropriate, we do is you you force the ten dollars for no shows, and when they show up and you finish the dentistry work, you give them the ten dollars back. So that they're not spending the money. But if people don't have skin in the game, they aren't going to show up. It's, it's just how it plays out. So in your practice, if you have people that get billed and then don't pay, they have no skin in the game. You know what I uh, thought when I got your book, The Pumpkin Plan? Um, I have all your books. Um, Thank you. The, the most interesting, I lecture in Australia about every five years to dentists down there. And I'm going back. Uh, I'll be in uh, uh Melbourne, uh, I think July 28th on a Saturday and the following Saturday I'll be in Sydney, is the most, almost every restaurant has pumpkin wine. And uh, really? there are pumpkins down there. They're, they're not orange. They're, they're green. They don't look like our pumpkins, but it's, it's obviously a pumpkin. It just stays green. But I always thought what a business it would be to import a bunch of pumpkin wine once a year for Halloween and really market. Oh, my God. Uh, you know, how many millennials would buy a bottle of wine if it had pumpkins on it? It was called pumpkin wine. I mean – I mean, a lot of businesses do all their sales seasonal. I mean, some, some people have 80% of their sales just during Christmas. And yeah. I, I always thought that would be uh, an amazing uh, business plan and uh, to import pumpkin wine. Plus, since I'm Irish, I'm an alcoholic and just have one, another reason to uh, um, import alcohol. Um, you also, this one is, uh, b- by the way, I mean, I can't believe I got a guy on my show um, that's um, – uh, a small business columnist for the Wall Street Journal, former MSNBC business makeover. But Business Week deemed this book a cult classic, oh, yeah. <laughs> The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. Now, I'm sure all my homies have just heard that, which, by the way, has 642 five-star reviews. What? How the hell did you come up with the name The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur? What does that even mean, and why yeah. did it become a cult classic? So you know, that was the first <laughs> book I wrote. And I realized to break into any industry, trying to be better than the competition is the biggest mistake people make. Don't be better, be different. And so what I started doing is I was lecturing around the college circuit, talking on certain topics. And one of the stories was about the toilet paper uh, experience and when you're short on toilet paper, how people react to it. And when I came back to these conferences, people said, you're the toilet paper guy. You're the toilet paper entrepreneur. So they assigned the label to me. So lesson one is be different. Lesson two is see what resonates with your client base and what do they remember, what sticks in their mind. That's the topic or that's the title. So that's how I came up with it. And the concept, it's a parable or it's an analogy that when we're scant on resources, our behavior changes. So the uh, the pseudo bathroom, bathroom humor here is when you only have three sheets of toilet paper, you still survive that situation. When your business is short on contact, resources, finances, we find a way. And so we intentionally want to, quote unquote, cripple our business. The fact you don't have contacts in this industry means you have to challenge the industry norms. The fact you don't have experience means you're going to have to break the rules. The fact you don't have money means you have to find innovative innovative ways to get the same results. So less resources triggers innovation, and innovation is your biggest advantage to stand out. But it, it, it is the total herd mentality. I mean, everybody comes out of dental yeah. school, and they try to just be exactly like the dentist across the street. Everybody wants to yeah. be unique, just like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, that's a good one. I never heard that before. Yeah. And that's, that's the bane to success is trying to copycat. It's the biggest mistake. You know, we were talking about niches earlier, find that community and speak to them in, in the way they want to be spoken to. And, and here's an even better way. Find out who you authentically are. Be totally true to yourself. If you had all the money in the world, how would you behave and build a practice around that? And that will attract all the money in the world because the people who resonate with the true you will be loyal customers forever. So what do you think uh, people have the biggest uh, problem with implementing profit first? What, 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 what do they stumble on when they try to do this? So, so back to profit first is when, when people stumble, they say, Mike, uh, I'm profitable now. And you're telling me to take my profit. I have to be profitable before I start taking my profit. And I say that that's actually the total mistake uh, because we're falling victim to Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law states the more a supply increases, in this case money, the more consumption increases. So I ask those owners, I say, why don't we just look at your history? Was there a time that your dentistry was smaller than it is today? Yeah, of course. Were you, you must have been losing huge amounts of money then, you you know? They said, no, no, I was just getting by. I said, well, where's your business now? Well, the, the revenue increased, but I'm still getting by. So I show them that as revenue increases, their expenses re- increase at the same rate. All we need, need to do is stick a wedge in there and they'll, they'll stand out. They'll start making a profit. The other thing that people resist, they say, Mike, if I set up all these bank accounts, the fees will crush me. Uh, those $5 fees, those $10 fees, I can't handle all those fees. You know what? Find a new bank. Uh, banks are businesses too. Negotiate with your existing bank if you like them and say, I'm not going to pay fees. If they're not willing to do that, go to a local regional bank or a federal credit union. They will credit you. I mean, they won't charge you fees. So there's always a way. But the biggest reason people don't do it is because it's unfamiliar. Uh, people are very comfortable with the familiar, even if it's not working. So business owners that are struggling check by check that don't do profit first say, but it's so new to me. I I can't do it. I'm going to keep doing what I was doing. And of course I never see results. And that's the definition of insanity. You know, it's funny because, um, you're right. You know, you, you can't, uh, you you don't get in life what you deserve. You get in life what you negotiate. And mm. uh, a lot of these um, young millennials, they don't like direct mail. They only like to advertise on Facebook because they're always on Facebook and they hate, they hate getting junk mail out of their mailbox. But these banks, they spend a million dollars a week right. sending all these direct mail, all these, uh, I mean, gosh darn it, it's just nonstop because they, if, if they send out a hundred and one guy gets a credit card, they think that's a bonanza. And so if you go into your bank manager and, and um, instead of getting what they threw at you, get what, you know, negotiate, just, just talk to them. And that's another thing I um, always think in my mind when, I, you know, the, someone will need to have a cavity and they'll need a filling. And I'll say it's 200 bucks. They say I don't get paid till Friday. And they'll say, um, um, I'll say, well, great, let's make an appointment after Friday. And they go, no, well, I want to have it done today. And I say, okay, well, we right. take credit cards. And they say, oh, I don't have a credit card. And I'm thinking, you know, I have four kids and they were all given credit card applications once a week starting at age 10. I mean, so Chase and Citibank and Wells Fargo, no one will give you a loan. You, you, a billion dollar a day bank won't give you a loan, but you want me to give you a loan. And then I say, well, I say, well, I'm a dentist. I'm not a bank. I I can't give you a loan. You have to go to a credit card. And as soon as they know that I will not do the filling today because they're not going to pay all of a sudden a credit card appears out of their wallet. (laughs) <laughs> oh well yeah. wait a minute wait a minute maybe, maybe I, totally forgot. May, I totally forgot i have money and yeah. uh and, and again it's that five percent of america who plays the game and they they know doctors uh that don't like to turn you over to collection but if, if you did a, a facelift on me and i didn't pay you and you turned me over to collection well i'll just run down to the medical board and say the reason i didn't pay is because you botched it and you did something wrong and right. so, and all that stuff and and I've had several malpractice attorneys tell me um, the biggest mistakes are like you saying, not getting rid of the bottom 10%. You knew when that lady was sitting in the chair that yeah. she was crazy, that her, her demands were uh, over the top, that yeah, she yeah. spent half the, the, the console bad-mouthing all the dentists before her. And then the other half is the collection policy. I mean, I, got, I know malpractice attorney says, you know, if nobody owes you money, you're really um, decrease your chance of getting sued or taken to the board. And then the other one is, I think the nature of a dentist is to heal their patient. And we're not judgmental. We don't care your politics, race, religion. We just want to help you, which is all true and fine until you get to crazy. 
And you know, <laughs> I, I can fix your tooth, but I can't fix crazy. And I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I've, I've had ladies that came in that brought in four different pictures of movie stars and wanted her teeth to look like that. And she had like three yeah. pages of notes. And I'm just looking at this lady thinking you're, you're completely out of your mind. And yeah. then, so I find somebody who advertises cosmetic dentistry and AACD and all that stuff. And it's like, I mean, I mean, I just can't wait to get them out of my office, but the young dentist thinks, well, you know, I got to work on everyone and I'm here for everyone. It's like, man, you, you're, you can't be, if you're all things to everyone, you're nothing to no one. That's exactly it. And that's, that crushes so many businesses because it's, it's the generalist mentality, you know, specialists become completely, they become elite and extremely capable in a very narrow category and can then attract those elite customers. So if a customer comes in with a very, very specific need, the specialist is designed to do that. And that's what we got to do. You know, and, and we can become a specialist in our own category, but if we try to bleed out and do all these different things, it, it, it's a recipe for disaster. So what, what do you think um, are other common pitfalls for uh, professionals? When, when you're dealing with um, physicians and dentists, would you, how, do you think they're all the same as someone who owned a bagel shop and a dry cleaner? Or do you think uh, dentists and physicians have different uh, biases or problems than people who own, say, general retail or agriculture or whatever? Well, you, yeah, I think they do have a slightly different re, uh, challenge. And what the challenge is, is that elite training we went through, right? So as a dentist, you went through at least eight years of advanced schooling and training, which means you have a very specific school set. The guy at the bagel shop, yeah, he's running a business. And I'll tell you, that is sophisticated, but didn't need that training. As a dentist, you got to need that training and you got to run a business. Here's the mistake I see professionals, high-end elite professionals mistake uh, make. They think that they can do everything. They think that, well, I can do the, ac the accounting at night. Um, I'll, I'll file the paperwork. I'll, I'll manage the patient's books uh, and records. And I'll do the dentistry work. That's the mistake. Th this, to find someone to file papers, to find someone to, um, to do the scheduling, to find someone to do the, the accounting and the bookkeeping work, those you can get higher, I mean, lower end people uh, with a lower salary to do that. So that will free you up to do the elite work you do. That is the bottleneck for the business is the, the dentist work itself. Every time the dentist I see filing papers, it drives me nuts because the dentist isn't doing the elite work that will drive revenue to the company. So I know it's scary to hire, you know, those people to do that lower level work. But if you as a dentist are doing that low, lower level work, you are crippling your business because you're not doing the necessary work to drive revenue. So what year, um, what, which one are you? Are you a generation X or what, what were you born? I'm 45. So whatever 45 is. What, what year were you born? 71. 71. So you're, um, you're generation X, generation uh, 65 X. to 79. Um, you know, I, I want to keep coming back to this one thing I see. I, I'm, I'm surprised the millennials keep listening to me. They probably think I don't like them. I obviously love them all for my kids are millennials. Um, millennials, 1980 to 95, but you know, baby boomers, you know, when they were, when they said they worked nine to five, they, they meant 95 hours a week and they all held two or three jobs. When a millennial says they work nine to five, they mean Monday through Thursday, nine to five. And <laughs> it also seems like the, it just seems to a hundred percent of all the dentists I know, 55 and over, they just, they, they just think millennials spend money. Like, like it was just coming yeah. off a, a, a printing yeah. machine. And, um, and then they, so, so they have a double curse. Their nine to five is literally Monday through Thursday, nine to five. And they spend like there's like a drunken sailor. And yeah. then the baby boomers, our nine to five is 95 hours a week. And we're saving money for rainy days. So yeah. how do you, how do you get through to that millennial that, um, I, I don't even think they think they spend a lot of money. I, I just saw a study last week that millennials eat out 19 times a week. I mean, mm. like, like I'm. I brew my coffee in the morning. They, they go to Starbucks and get a $5 right. one. I mean, it's just like, a, right. um, you know, I mean, uh, the, the joke is if you want to hide something from millennial, you put it in the oven because they'll never find it. <laughs> uh, so how do you, how do you, and, and I'm scared for my homies because we're all dentists. They're, they're in the sacred sovereign profession we call dentistry. And they're already starting behind the eight ball, 350 yeah. to $500,000 yeah. in debt. And yeah. for some reason, um, they, you know, their first house is too big. Uh, their, their, their first car yeah. is too nice. I mean, uh, so, yeah. so if you're working less and they'll tell you, they'll say, well, I don't want to be like my dad. I mean, my dad was a dentist and my God, he worked 
five and a half days a week for 40 years and died of a heart attack. I, I, I don't want to do I want to I want to be well-rounded. So right. I'm going to take off Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Right. So they work less, spend more. How do you get how do you get into their head? Yeah, so I, I don't think they're a hundred percent wrong. I do think there's a challenge there. I think the greatest generation ha- is something wrong too. So my parents are from the greatest generation, and it's work, 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 and then die the richest man in the graveyard. So it's rich, <laughs> it's, you know. So it's, it's what's just wonderful, but what, you know, what value is that? So I think it's somewhere in between. There, there is a work-life balance, and I think the millennials understand that and are actually executing on it. Where the prior generation, we just worked talking about a work-life balance, but didn't achieve it. Of course, the flip side for millennials, like you pointed out, is we're spending more than we're making, so it's also a downward spiral. It's not going to be sustainable. I, I think the, the middle ground is to reverse engineer our lifestyle, basically saying, what is the life? I want to live and commit to living. What's the standard? And what kind of income do I need to support that? Say it's 100,000 a year. Then you reverse engineer saying, well, if there's 65% overhead in my business and X, Y, Z, I need to generate, say, $400,000 in revenue. And then if I want to do this four days a week, how many patients do I need to see? Uh, What kind of services do I, am I putting crowns on? Or can I just do cleanings for that? You have to figure out your mix of services. But when you reverse engineer it, you'll come up with a plan. I think the mistake that all generations have is no plan. One generation just says, save, 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 work, work, work. Okay, for what? The other generation says, live life to the fullest. But how? So we got to reverse engineer it, and then the truth will reveal itself. You you talk about profit, and that is one, as uh, you said, a KPI, a key performance index. Yeah. Are there any other key KPIs that you think a business should look at, track, or any other favorite KPIs for you? Yeah, I mean, well, anything that drives profit. So profit itself is a great measurement because it's it's cash on hand. That's how I define profit. Not an accounting profit, but actual cash on hand reserve. But I think another thing is the products or services that provide that. So, uh, you know, how many fillings do I do per week? We should be tracking that. You know, if I'm averaging, say, 40 fillings a week, I'm just picking a random number here, but if that's the number, that may indicate business is healthy. But I see one week all of a sudden that drops to 10, that's a red flag. The idea of a KPI is a simple number that the second it changes out of the norm, meaning there's a deviance, that we say, oops, what's going on? Either a good thing or a bad thing. So you got to look at your business, but for dentists, I think it's certain products or or services like fillings. A number of cancellations could be a big one. That's lost revenue and lost profitability. So pick numbers that the second it deviates from the norm, that's an indicator for a problem or an opportunity in your business. And it'll be a flag for you to take action on. Um. I think I, mean, I graduated from middle school May 11, 87, and October 87 was Black Monday, and it was mm. it was not pretty. The Dow dropped 500 points when I remember was, that. I mean, it, it it was brutal, and I I thought that was the best gift our graduating class could have ever got of 1987 was that you know it's not always going to be a rosy day. And then this 2008, I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona, and there's different numbers, but somewhere between like 74. And 88 dental offices went bankrupt. And mm. I thought the movie The Big Short, uh, I got an MBA from ASU, and I thought The Big Short um, was one of the uh, greatest movies of all time in the fact that at least it taught the economic lesson, and it got amazing five-star reviews from people who had PhDs in economics. They're like, man, you you explained that really, really well. Um, but um, I, think, um, I think the older people have seen a lot of rainy days, and these young people don't see a lot of rainy days. My, my specific question is on cars. Like, I remember when that happened and there were dentists in my front room crying. And the first thing I would say is, uh, well, you know, you drive a Mercedes, your wife drives a Land Rover, um, and you got this fancy sports car. Why don't we start with just selling those? And they, they couldn't. They were, they were leasing them. Right. And, 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 and so much of their monthly overhead, they couldn't even get out of, you know, real estate collapsed. So their houses were upside down and liquid. But what would you say to a young millennial who just asked you like a basic question? You think she should lease that brand new seventy five thousand dollar Beamer or should she buy it or does it even matter? Yeah, so don't get the freaking seventy-five thousand dollar Beamer. So, because I've been there, uh, when, when I sold my second company, I, I was a self-made millionaire in my early thirties. I, I was in computer crime investigation and just was in the right place at the right time. And my ego kicked in, 
And here's why I learned. No one cares about that $75,000 Beamer except for you, the person driving it. And if you care about it, it means you're in an ego mindset. Like, hey, world, look at me. Look how great I am. No one really cares. Because I found out when I had that stuff, no one noticed. And when I lost the stuff, no one even knew I had it in the first place. So any of those artifacts of success, any of those trophies, if you will, I found have no significance except to feed our ego. And then that becomes a trap because it, the Beamer isn't enough. Now maybe it's the bigger house. If the bigger house isn't enough, maybe it's the second house. Live within your means. The stress of trying to support these superfluous trophies is of no value. What is a value I found from my experience is a stress-free life where we live within our means. And if you want to acquire that BMW or that big house or that second house, you have to achieve that standard of income first and be able to pay for it with cash. If you can buy it cash, listen, there is no stress. You just take possession of that thing when you want it. The editor, <laughs> the editor of Dental Town Magazine since 2000 is uh, Tom Giacobbe. And it was so funny because, uh, he bought a thousand dollar beater uh, car in in dental school, Love it. and uh, I mean he drove that thing. I mean he drove that thing till the wheels fell. I mean he and then his next car was a brand new, you know, BM suburban or whatever in cash. But I mean it was it was amazing how uh, uh, minimalist uh, he uh, he lived. I, I think uh, it's not what you make, uh, it's what you uh, you spend, and it's just that bottom. But I, I also think it's a big difference you're talking to the girl dentist listening to you versus the boy because the girls 30 percent of the women dentists married a male dentist in their class and the other 70 percent married someone with a nice <laughs> job engineers physicians lawyers yeah but when that single <laughs> male dentist is is driving around a bmw um that that he can't even afford what does that attract some somebody some girl who thinks he's rich and if i That's marry true. you you'll n i'll never have to work a day in their life and it's right. so sad because so many of the guys are mar married women who don't have jobs and who spend 10000 a month. And all the girls married a doctor, dentist, lawyer, engineer, someone who makes $10,000 a month. And the difference over age 25 to 65 is several million dollars. So yeah. they talk about being $350,000 of student loans, but that Beamer just attracted someone who's going to spend three million dollars before they're 65 and that doesn't even show up on the balance sheet yeah well shame shame on the guys for putting that illusion and for them to allow that spending behavior to continue for both of them and and shame on the gals for saying hey i, I got a free ride here i mean the goal is uh, that spending money it to me it just brings about stress it, it, it's debt it's money that will be owed at some point in some way and that becomes overwhelming and now you're just surviving to in, in running a business to feed the credit card company. It just, it spells out disaster. You got to live so, within your so means. So I'm going to ask you, so you're 45 years old. What what do you think m makes you different? Was it, was it your father? Do you think it was nature? Was it nurture? Oh, no. Was it desperation? No, I, was it inspiration? What, what, well, maybe, what, maybe all what of the made, above. What pulled your string and made you roll? All of the above. Uh, but the big one that I'll never forget was after I sold my second company, a fortune 500 acquired it. I was a millionaire. And then I blew the money because I got the the seven series, I got the Land Rover, I got the Dodge Viper, I, I started a, a stable of cars. I did all that stuff, which is now total nonsense. Back then, I was like, "Wow, look at my success! I got to show success to the world." But then I lost it all, and. When I lost all my money through my own arrogance and ignorance, that was the great wake-up call I needed, that no one cares about the money. Uh, it is necessary and important to sustain life. It's important to, uh, to experience life the way I want to experience. I believe in financial freedom. I don't believe in, in flourish and just wasting money. So that was kind of the wake-up call. My, that kind of, it was the wake-up call. And so now I live within my means, and I love it. And I keep expanding what my means are, but I always live within it. So, uh, um, so which one of these books do you think they should buy first? I noticed on Amazon, you can buy all your books for 50 bucks. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a hell of a deal. Uh, yeah. are these books in audio too? Audio, Kindle, ebook, yeah. every bookstore and the, you know, wherever you shop for books, you know, I, I don't know what book is right for people. The pro if, if, if a dentist is watching right now and isn't profitable, read profit first. If a dentist is watching right now and their practice isn't growing, read the pumpkin plan. If, if you're just starting out as a dentist, read the toilet paper entrepreneur. If you want to capture a market and, and milk it for all it's worth in a positive sense, read surge. So 
ask first what the challenges you're facing and then find the book that serves it. Nice, nice, nice. Well, uh, I've um, retweeted on Twitter uh, that Thank book. You. So if you, uh, they're driving to work. So uh, if you go to my uh, Twitter, uh, at Howard Ferran, uh, my last tweet uh, is the man himself. Profit first, transform your business from a cash eating monster to a money making machine on Amazon.com. So all you got to do is click that link and you're on Amazon and there's all of his books. And uh, I just, um, you know, I, I'm a dentist, so I, I get it. I mean, there's nothing more fun than uh, pulling a wisdom tooth and doing a root canal. I mean, I get it. And it's, it's pulling wisdom teeth is so damn fun that when people fail, the financial arrangement don't have afforded them. That, that's when I can't even let it go. I just like, okay, well, I'll just do it anyway for free. Like you say, the charity. Uh, and I know it's charity because it's just too damn much fun to let a set of wisdom teeth walk out that needed removed. <laughs> Uh, that, uh, you, uh, I mean, it's just, uh, that, that's just probably the, that, that, that's my golf. I mean, four hours of whacking a white ball around, compare that to five minutes of pulling out four wisdom teeth, not even close, but I'm trying to be a leader in trying to lead these kids that I know that's what you want to do, but you have to focus on these numbers. They don't know their key performance indicators. They don't know the difference between a statement of cash flow and a balance sheet and a P and L. They don't know any of this stuff. And what's worse than that, they're not interested. So my no. question to you is, um, how do you get a 25-year-old dentist who wants to take every root canal course known to man from here to Kathmandu, and then you're sitting there at the dental convention lecturing in the next room, and you're like, hey, hey, come, come over here. I need, to, I need to talk about this little thing called business and profit and money. So how do you get someone to be good at something they're not interested in? Ima imagine... If I wanted to yeah. you to be a master violinist and the only thing you said is I don't even want to touch a violin. I have no interest in music, but you have to be a pianist. Yeah. How, how do you how do you get people to have interest in something they're not interested in? Yeah. So I show as a means to an end, meaning I can't make you interested in violin if you don't want to pay violin. But I can ask you, what do you love to do? And is this a vehicle to get there? So if I don't care about the books or finances. I can't make you interested. But if, if you love tearing out wisdom teeth, then I ask you <laughs> to keep doing this for the next five or 10 years. What do you need to do that? Well, I need the tools to do and the training and I need the money to, to have the office. Okay. So let's worry about having the office so you can keep doing what you're passionate about. So if it's not your calling, if it's not your interest, at least it's a means to an end and I'll show you how to navigate the means. We're living in the United States where half the marriages fail. Most research shows they fail in a three subjects, a third, a third, a third, money, sex, and substance abuse. So what would you say, uh, since you're a money expert, um, right now, you're probably talking to a lot of couples here coming into work. Uh, one spouse is the dentist, the other spouse, he's the office manager. Maybe it's two dentists mm -hmm. that met in dental school. If, this, if, if you're talking to two people commuting to work right now and they're married, and if they get divorced, it's going to be extremely likely it's oh. going to be over money. What would, you, what would you say, put on your marriage advice hat, how, does, how do you, um, what do you recommend when it comes to money and marriage? <laughs> yeah, so it's funny. My wife your, that ought to be your next book, Money and, and marriage. marriage. Yeah, my wife has probably a better answer to this. So I, we did a program together called Married to Mayhem, and here's what I discovered. One is both of you need to be involved in the finances so you know what's going on and need to have equal contribution, equal input. If one person controls it all, uh, the other person will either feel victimized, out of control, or, or point blame. But the other thing is you have to find a common language. And, and here's this is totally outside the scope of what we're talking about, but there's a fabulous book my wife and I discovered called The Five Love Languages. And I'll tell you, that has helped us navigate the biggest challenges in our marriage, just appreciating each other's communication style, a love language understanding communication style, we've been able to navigate and discuss, you know, some really hard topics, including money. Yeah. That was an amazing book on uh, the five yeah. love languages. Uh, do, do you remember them off the top of your head? Uh, acts of service gifts, quantity time or quality time. Um, I think that's three. Uh, I think physical touch was four and I can't remember what the fifth was. Yeah. I think that was an amazing, uh, an amazing book. Um, but, uh, Oh, and Hey, Howard, I'm sorry. I just got notice I got to be on another live interview. It's happening okay. Right well, now. Hey, Hey, you spent 55 minutes with my homies. I can't believe I got you on the, on, I mean, <laughs> someone of your credentials 
His website is uh, well, what? Do we, what? What's easy? What to go to remember? Profit Mike first Mc- professionals. Yeah, you go to profit first professionals or go to mikemotorbike.com. That's easy to spell. That'll bring you to mikekalowitz.com. Okay. Thank you so much. It was such How an honor that? and a flattery that you came on my show. Seriously, dude. Unbelievable. It's been a joy. Thanks Thank for you, coming brother. to talk to a bunch of dentists. <laughs> you were a coward. I'll see you later.